Good morning and welcome to Member Focus Monday. I'm Christina Schaefer, Director of Social Media for HAR, and I am joined this morning by HAR's legal counsel, Grant Harpold. Welcome back to the program, Grant. Hey, good morning, Christina. Good to see you. Glad to be back. Thank you. It's good to see you too. And I'm so glad that you were able to join us today as we are kicking off Fair Housing Month. April is Fair Housing Month for Realtors. And we just thought it would be so great to get your legal expertise in regard to fair housing because there are so many, uh, so much room for error that I think we can discuss. So um, before we do that, though, if you could, uh, for our members who don't know who you are just yet, if you could tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, I'm, so I'm legal counsel for HAR. I'm a partner in the law firm of Buck Keenan. I've been doing, representing and advising real estate brokers for 30 years. I'm board certified in civil trial law and have been since 1997, which makes me a part of less than 1% of the state bar that has that qualification. And I enjoy, uh, I enjoy this topic a lot, uh, the, the far ranging topics dealing with uh, broker issues, including fair housing. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much um, for joining us today to discuss this. But again, with it being Fair Housing Month, we wanted to hear your legal expertise regarding fair housing. So to start, can you explain what the Fair Housing Act of 19 or 1968 is, why it was enacted, and how has it changed since that time? Well, that's I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked because this is to me, it's 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 very fascinatingly sad in some regards, but um, positive in other regards. I mean, think about this. The Emancipation Proclamation was issued by President Lincoln in 1863. Mm -hmm. The Civil War ended in 1865. And the it wasn't until 1948 that the Supreme Court issued a case prohibiting discrimination in relation to housing. So think about that from the mid 1800s to 1948. And then it wasn't until uh, President Johnson signed in the Fair Housing Act of 1968. So you still had 20 more years where you had a you had a court decision, but you had no way of enforcing it. Mm -hmm. There was no statutory scheme. There was no administration or executive branch office that would enforce what the Supreme Court was saying until 1968 with the Fair Housing Act. And here's let me just talk about that. What happened then? The Fair Housing Act was actually intended to be passed back in 1964 when the Civil Rights Act was passed, but it did not. It, it got hung up in Congress. This is this is the sad part. Fascinatingly sad. Martin Luther King was assassinated today, April 4, back in 1968. And when that happened, the Senate that day, that very day, April 4, 1968, took up this bill, Fair Housing Act, and passed it. Mm -hmm. And then they sent it back to the House. The House passed it on April 10, 1968. And President Johnson signed it into law on April 11, 1968. So bad circumstances, but a, a, a uh, sadly, like I said, fascinating, mm -hmm. fascinatingly sad that it, that it had to come to that, but it, we, the bill got passed and then it got amended. And so what it does prohibits discrimination in housing based on sex, religion, national origin, and then race. And then also in 19, uh, let's see, 1988, mm -hmm. President Reagan, Congress passed another amendment to the to the Fair Housing Act and added, um, that was signed by President Reagan and added um, uh, family status and disability mm -hmm. as part of the fair housing that discrimination cannot be based on that also. And then in 1995, I think President Clinton added an exception that allowed for senior care type facilities, some, uh, you know, a special exemptions for people that are 55 and over for certain you know, retirement type communities are living in that space. So it's been, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's got a lot of history to it. And it's been something that is, is, uh, afforded a lot more opportunity and, but it's not perfect. And it's still, people still don't know about it or still walk across that line and violate it. Right. And maybe don't fully understand it in some, in right. some cases, or don't understand what, what the, those different statuses mean. Um, so, uh, when listing a property, what should agents be cautious of? What should they be aware of specifically in the language they use? Well, I'm going to start off with a, with a word or two words, be inclusive, don't be exclusive. And mm -hmm. so 
that's sort of the theme, the running theme I'll have here today, and that should be in every agent's mind is be inclusive. And so, um, so for example, you don't want to you don't want to take your listing and advertise it. And I have a few words that I put down here, like it's perfect for newlyweds, where that's that's singling out a certain class of people that to the exclusion of perhaps others. So that that's a red flag right there. Um, don't put in there like country club nearby. That again is is perhaps singling out or excluding certain people from access to that property, or mm -hmm. at least theoretically. Walking distance from a church or synagogue, another no no, because again, you're now you're now making it more exclusive versus inclusive. Mm -hmm. Ideal bachelor pad, again, that would seem to signal to families you're not wanted, children you're not wanted. Uh, adult building, again, uh, unless it's a special exemption for a certain age of group of people and set up under a particular way, you can't, again, limit or be exclusive in one regard and, and, and not in inclusive overall. So it's, you know, the, the, the key to remember is that uh, be inclusive. Wonderful. Christine uh, made a comment here. She said, I remember when apartments and homes would have only adult homes, excluding children in the early 80s. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. and so, like I said, in 1988, when Reagan signed the, the bill that amended that, that, that changed. And hopefully, I'm not saying it doesn't still happen, but hopefully it's at least not you know, blatantly or, or advertising or some sort of marketing in that regard is is, is an absolute no-no. Okay, very good. So let's talk a little bit about buyer love letters. This is seemingly always a hot topic, made even hotter recently with some states banning the use of them. Is it legal in Texas to advise your clients um, to write a buyer love letter? And if so, what language and topics should they avoid? Well, it's it's not illegal. Let's put it that way. There is no statute that prohibit. You know, Oregon passed a statute that actually prohibited the use of, of love letters, and not, and it's under attack from First Amendment free speech mm -hmm. people saying that you know you can't limit my speech in that regard. We all know that the First Amendment can be limited in speech. You can't yell fire in a movie theater. That's not that's not free speech. Mm -hmm. And so there are, there are limitations to speech. So we'll see how that case in Oregon goes. But in Texas, there is no there is no trick rule on this. There is no statutory rule on this. It's really coming down from a, a lot of direction. And on this is coming down from NAR. And, and, and again, in theory, if, if you put into a love letter all about yourself and your family or or the kind of or, the, you know, I'm excited about this house because of the church down the street or you're near the country club, whatever you might say in a love letter that talks about everything else but the property mm. can be troublesome because again is forcing or perhaps causing the seller to make a decision to sell it to you or not sell it to you mm -hmm. because of what you put in the letter uh we don't have any reported cases on this issue so i can't say well look here's here's a here's a case example and here's here's how we need to now act accordingly we don't mm -hmm. have that yet but i think sensitivity is, is is still following along the same theory that it that we that we're our theme here is that it's not being inclusive if you start carving out a certain kind of people that are now interested in buying your house or that you may sell to or that are looking at it. And so, uh, you know, NAR says don't do it. Don't mm -hmm. don't be part of any love letter. You know, don't don't read them. Don't pass them on. Don't do anything. And so, um, you know, that's and, but if you do do one, I think that the kind of the exception to that is, is make sure that the the, um, the words in the letter really focus on the property and the property aspects, nothing about yourself or, or the neighborhood itself, so mm -hmm. to speak, might seem to be not so inclusive. And so that's, that's kind of, you know, there's, and I, I can keep going, but there's, there's other issues related to that. Maybe you're, you're under the, you know, you feel like as a fiduciary, you got to do this and that. I, I think mm -hmm. ultimately you, you need to be there to advise your client about the, the risk involved in doing one or not or allowing one and then note to your file that that was done. And if, and if the, and if there is a love letter that involves some things that may be troublesome note to the file that the seller, uh, you know, perhaps made the decision mm -hmm. to buy or not, or to sell or not sell the property because of the financing terms or the price of the house that was offered or, or the inspections that 
repairs were wanting to be made from something that is non demographic related. Okay. Uh, Carlene has a good comment here. It says there's no way to verify that the listing agent has included the love letter when they present their offer to the seller either. So it, it could be kind of a waste of time. It sounds like as well. Yeah. yeah. You know, and something else just on the front end of that is that mm -hmm. you can, as a listing agent in consultation with your client, the seller, you put on the front end in the MLS notes that, uh, you know, we do not accept uh, love letters. Mm -hmm. And so, and if one comes in, you, you send it right back. Don't even, don't look at it. Don't pass it on. If that's your understanding of, of your relationship with your mm -hmm. client. The seller. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful advice. And I've definitely seen some listings that, that say that in the agent remarks. So let's flip it to the other side now. Um, when accepting offers, what should listing agents advise their clients in regard to fair housing? Well, I think, again, the, the theme is in being inclusive. And, you know, the, the if you get a question from your client, the, 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 the seller ask, inquiring about, you know, who, who are the what kind of family this is or who are do they have kids or do they mm -hmm. you know, where are they what neighborhood are they moving from? Something that might suggest that the seller is probing on who they might be selling their property to that has to do with everything but the the price the terms you know things germane to the property when mm -hmm. if the seller starts going off getting off the freeway and into the ditch about who is this that, that i'm selling the property to uh where are they from what what kind of family they have what mm -hmm. you know anything that we just spoke about that could be lead to discriminatory conduct by the seller maybe unintentionally maybe maybe intentionally believe i mean there's some of this can be intentional some can be unintentional mm -hmm. but if the seller starts probing the uh the offerer for you know things other than the property or or maybe a their ability to finance the property um you know that's that's where you need to step in and warn them about the uh the aspects of the fair housing and that there cannot be any sort of discrimination, intentional, or unintentional in relation to who is buying this property or who is making an offer on the property. So that is a role you have on the front end. If it, if it, if you see it slipping that way, or if you just get a question out of the blue that just slaps you upside the head, say, wait a second, you know, this is here it is. So mm -hmm. I need to respond and say, we can't go there. That's wrong. And, and uh, right. next question. So yes. yeah, that, that really, that was my next question for you is if, if you have a client or customer that's asking you for advice or asking you a question or, you know, anything like that, that, you know, is a violation of the fair housing act, how do you approach that? Because I think some agents find themselves in those situations and don't really know how to respond. Well, and it's, it's delicate. So mm -hmm. you don't, I mean, you rebuke them, but in a nice way. So, you, you know, it's and it, and it gets back to education. I maybe they don't really know. Mm -hmm. Maybe their DNA is wrong. I don't I don't we don't know. OK, mm -hmm. but educate them in a, in a nice and communicative way. Be, be responsive, be communicative and, and educate them and, and explain to them not only that that's the law, but that's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. and, so, you know, and the focus here should be selling your property and getting the price that you want for your property, not worrying about who it might be that is buying your property. And because that's when you get into the slippery slope and you could, you know, and there's, there's, we may not have a, a case example about love letters mm -hmm. and discrimination claim in relation to that, but there's plenty of case studies and actual, actual claims where people have been discriminatory mm -hmm. and who they who they were trying to sell the property to yeah those okay. cases do exist. sadly they do exist and they and they probably will continue to exist but but you know the more education the more communication the more explaining mm -hmm. uh, we do then then one day maybe we'll won't have those cases anymore and i think it really can happen in any situation i mean you're hosting an open house somebody might come in and ask you a question or say something you know, we just have to always be prepared to, to educate, it sounds like. We do. And it's not a, you know, it's not a north south issue. OK, it's not just limited to the south. I mean, it, it happens up north. And so it's really a human issue. 
It's not a geographic issue. It's a human issue. So it can, it can happen anywhere at any time. And, and it's just something to, uh, that should, you know, should set off a red flag. If, if, if people start inquiring about who, who is this and, and why, and where they, you know, just things that mm -hmm. get into more personable aspects of the transaction versus business as aspects. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, because I, I do think that agents sometimes find themselves in those sticky situations and don't really know how to navigate it. So we appreciate that. If you have any questions for Grant, please type them in. I have more questions for him, but if anyone else has questions, go ahead and type them in and we'll get to those in a little bit. Um, now, so Grant, are agents liable if a fair housing complaint is filed on their client? Well, that's a good question. Well, all your questions are good. So, <laughs> so um, well, if the claim is against the seller and not the agent, okay, well, so the, the seller gets the claim now and, and not the agent. I mean, there can be a situation where the claim comes solely against the seller and not the agent. Could come A claim could come against both. But the one aspect, if the claim just comes against the seller, the seller could always turn around in a separate claim or, or perhaps ethics violation or, or negligence claim and say, well, gosh, I wish, I wish my listing agent had told me this. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't know. And, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't around in 1968. I don't, you know, I, you know, just some silly response, but still, mm -hmm. you know, they, they try to, as we know, not just in fair housing, but in a lot of other transactions, it's, it's really easy for the, seller to blame the listing agent so i would not be shocked in these types of cases if and when they come up that the seller again may default back to a, a lot of uh, conduct that they that they do and that is to uh, blame the listing agent yeah that makes sense um we have a question that came in from uh, one of our members uh, cindy said is it considered any type of discrimination if a seller does not want to accept an offer from an investor? No. No. I mean, if it's simply just just an investor, mm -hmm. and there's in and, and that's that's it, then no. I mean, not not knowing any more of the facts, but that just on its face, it sounds like it's it's just a, a financial or investment issue not so much related to who the investor is now it's, if we get into who the investor is or who they represent and, and what kind of uh, you know background they have then mm -hmm. then you're going to have a problem and let me back up also on the um you know on the um on the buy side. this just is this issue of fair housing is not, not just on the listing side of course it can be on the buy side if, if the if the buyer is trying to have you direct them to certain properties for certain reasons that are related to any of the the uh, violations of the Fair Housing Act, race, mm -hmm. sex, disability, anything. So if the, if, if the buyer, don't let the buyer trap you into, into performing the dirty work of finding properties that sort of meet their demographic standard, if you will. Okay, very good. Um, TJ said, I'd love to hear comments on listing agents requiring a driver's license versus, accept, versus accepting ID, uh, like a state ID. Can you require tenants to produce a driver's license? Well, I think that's, you know, my understanding is that that is not uncommon and that it, it sort of is some aspect or the way to determine um, you know, that, you know, who this person is as far if, if strictly for identity purposes, that's where it, it, it needs to start and end and uh, just to know who this person is and, and not anything beyond that. If it takes it beyond the use of the ID, I don't care what kind of ID it is. Mm -hmm. The use of the ID is more than simply an affirmation of who this person is. And that's when you get into trouble. Okay. Um, Tammy had a question here. What about uh, owners of rentals that are adamant about not having pets, um, but then maybe you have somebody that has a uh, assistance pet or help pet of some animal of some kind. Well, you got to be sensitive to that. And there's, mm -hmm. you know, you can, you can go to, you know, the disability is a, is a, is a fair housing issue. And, and if the person has a pet for that reason, then that is some sort of accommodation you may have to provide to that potential tenant because mm -hmm. it's an, it's an issue of disability. 
-hmm. And an issue of accommodation, once that disability is in place, and the issue of accommodation is upon you and you it needs to be fulfilled. You can't simply say, well, we just don't accommodate. Sorry, uh, mm -hmm. go to the next landlord. That's not how it works. Okay. Um, another question here, and this is going back to the financing that we were discussing earlier. Um, is it okay for an agent to harshly refuse an FHA offer versus a conventional offer um, when the house qualifies for both? Um, that's a, a harshly refuse. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't. I haven't seen an issue in that regard. Mm -hmm. As and far as the, she, sorry, Grant, she uh, followed it up with just because they don't feel like dealing with FHA is that discriminatory? I haven't seen that issue come up to where I could say that is. So I'm going to say that you know it's to be determined. But I haven't seen where that distinction is made or drawn as a way or means of some of uh, discrimination. Okay. Um, Hannah kind of has a comment here that I, I think we should touch on. During the height of COVID, I had a listing agent question my buyer's employment, um, basically asking how essential they were. Um, so again, is this a form of discrimination? Possibly. I mean, again, I, the focus should be on the property. Um, you know, I, I guess the, the, on the list side or the seller side maybe was concerned about their ability to come through or go through with the purchase, but uh, that's a slippery slope when you start trying to determine because if, depending on how they're employed, that may reveal as to who they are or mm -hmm. some reveal something more than, hey, there this is an offer from a buyer. Mm -hmm. and, and then you reject the offer because of where they work and perhaps they work at, at something that tells more about them that you might would not already know. And then you make a decision because now maybe this person is one of one, one of those that, that works at this kind of place. And so right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to lease it or sell it to this person. And so that's, I think that's a slippery slope. If you start getting to those sort of more personal details and details that don't concern the property itself. Okay. Very good. Um, and we did share a link in the comments for uh, with information about assistance animals. I see there was another question about that, but we did share a link there that hopefully everybody can go check out if they have more questions about assistance animals and and all that uh, is entailed there. Um, so, Grant, where do consumers go to file a complaint? Well, there's there's multi, you know the easy answer is Google, but no, let me let me be more specific. <laughs> Um, Texas Workforce Commission, mm -hmm. if you at least go to their website, they have a, a, a process for taking those claims. HUD, ha you know, Housing and Urban Development, HUD, H-U-D, is another way mm -hmm. you know, on their website to file these claims. And so, um, and there's also nonprofits that are out there that kind of guide you through filing mm -hmm. a claim. And so there's, there's, there's really no excuse for for not filing a claim if, if, right. if a claim is warranted because there is multiple avenues and, and multiple government agencies that will address these claims. I mean, it could also be a, it could be just a straight ethics claim against the uh, the broker. If, if, if the broker has done something or the listing agent's done something or the buyer's agent's done something that's mm -hmm. perhaps a violation, it could be an ethics, ethics claim, could possibly be a trek claim. So you could actually address these issues to some degree outside of the the uh, the fair housing uh, application through HUD or through Texas mm -hmm. Workforce. Now, I don't know why you're thinking, Grant, are you right about that? Texas Workforce Commission is where I file like fair housing. Yes, I don't, I can't explain the, why you're <laughs> in the Texas Workforce Commission, but that's where it is. And so don't be shocked when you see that's that's one of the process, or one of the avenues mm -hmm. that allows you to pursue a claim. Okay. So out of curiosity, locally, what are the majority of fair housing violations in regard to? I think the trend locally and nationally, I think that it tracks national is disability. And um, I think people, especially landlords, and even, you know, don't, um, on a, and it's more, in, I think, common than a lease transaction is the, uh, you know, is the, the how broad and, and, and how, um, 
there did, needs to be more inclusiveness on disabilities and recognizing and understanding and being sensitive to the various aspects of one's disability, whether it be physical or mental. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's, I think that's where there's still trouble and still a, a lack of education on, on that. And, and sometimes it's, it's maybe it's not as clear as to what is going on on, on the issue from the, from the landlord's perspective. They, they're not fully aware of the situation or fully informed. And so mm -hmm. I think that's, that seems to be the trend nationally and locally is, is, is claims related to uh, discrimination based on a disability. Okay. All right. Great. Um, so we've got some some thank yous going on in the in the comments. I don't see any other questions at this time. Um, but Grant, is there anything else that you want to share with our members in regard to fair housing? I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna if we're getting close to the end, I'll just go back to what I said at the beginning: is you, be inclusive. I mean, you know, uh, maybe that's not natural. Uh, maybe it is natural, you know, uh, some things we have to try harder at. I mean, that's, that's mm -hmm. okay. We're human, remember? And so if, if don't, um, just be sensitive to uh, the, the aspect or the term inclusive. And so inclusive means everybody, everybody sits at the table. Everybody gets an opportunity. Everybody, uh, stands the same. There is no pecking order. There is no me versus you or i'll take you over over that and so it's on the buy side and on the sell side the listing side the buy side be sensitive to to the fact that discrimination still occurs and don't get don't get caught into where somebody is trying to make a decision based on the who it is versus what the property is mm -hmm. okay wonderful um just to clarify misty had a follow-up question um, as a listing agent, if you're not going to accept love letters as suggested here, what should the verbiage say on the listing? So what exactly should they put in the agent remarks? Well, I would perhaps get with my broker on that and address that. But I, I mean, simply no love letters accepted. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would make it back to the just communication, just make it as clear and expressive and short as possible. So there is no... There's no wrongful interpretation. It is what it is. No level letters accepted. Okay. Uh, Leslie asked, can a seller request their agent don't allow showings to a specific buyer agent, buyer, or agents from a specific brokerage? No. Meaning that I'm, we're not going to allow, we're not going to entertain something from this particular. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I mean, that, that may, that may be fair housing, but I know for sure it's antitrust, meaning that sort of sounds anti-competitive if you're going to mm -hmm. pick and choose who you're going to accept an offer from based on who the brokerage or who the business entity is. So I mean, uh, that could be our next topic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll leave that one for next time. But yes, yeah. great. Okay, wonderful. Uh, well, I don't see any other questions at this at this time. Again, Grant, thank you so much for your time this morning. Um, the words I'm hearing are be inclusive, um, yes. and educate, right? Right. Know your history too. I mean, it's a sad day that today is when Martin Luther King was mm -hmm. assassinated, but it also brought about the fair housing act and the multiple amendments that have come to it over the years. And mm -hmm. so, and there may be more in the future. So it's, you know, it, it got in place a, a statute and a law that allowed the government to enforce and go after and and uh, and allow for there to be housing without discrimination or at least in theory okay wonderful um again grant thank you so much uh and we always enjoy having you on this program so i'm sure we'll have you back soon <laughs> thank you christina always enjoy it too you're thank the greatest you. thank <laughs> you well that is it for this member focus monday we'll see you guys next monday at 9 a.m have a great week Bye-bye. Bye-bye.